present her work from a Louis Rosenberg Travel Scholarship. She's been doing independent research in Vietnam, comparing the traditional laterite bricks with conventional brick and concrete construction. This research will be presented at the American Solar Energy Association conference. Allison has had a really adventurous spirit. She's gone abroad to Kyoto, to Israel, and then to Vietnam, where she traveled by herself, which I thought was quite amazing. At home, she was not a uh, you know, wallflower either. She attended the Outdoor Survival School in Boulder, Colorado, and created a competition-winning video about Portland's homeless camp, Dignity Village. Allison's deep commitment to making a difference is shown by her volunteer work for the Hope's Ecological Design Conference. I'd like you to welcome Allison, please. If you want AIA credits, talk to me. I have to. So, official. Um, so, as Nancy said, I'm just presenting my work and experiences in Vietnam. And just to kind of give you, give you an idea of the background, I guess, of what, what my studies were, um, I'll give an introduction to Vietnam and then a brief history of Hanoi. And then, uh, and then I'll go into my material study. And I'm doing this because. I went to Vietnam knowing that I wanted to research this mysterious brick that I'd heard my brother talk about that everyone builds their stuff out of. Um, so it was like an earth brick, and that sounded counterintuitive to me in a hot, humid climate. And so that's why I wanted to go, was to kind of study why, you know, is this a vernacular tradition or a tradition that, that they've adopted from other countries. Um, and as I got there, my study kind of changed a little bit, which is to be expected. Uh, but I think it's for the better. And some interesting things to present, I hope. <laughs> so Vietnam is bordered on the north by China and on the west by Laos and Cambodia. Um, it is now open to the world market. It used to be clo a closed economy because it's a communist country. Um, it's now the 11th most populated country in the world. And it's also one of the youngest in terms of the average age of people. So it's, there's lots of vibrant communities and lots of action. Um, also, uh, Hanoi is the capital of Vietnam, while Saigon is kind of the economic powerhouse of Vietnam. Mm -hmm. If you ever plan on going to Vietnam, <laughs> uh, this is my favorite food. It's called Cha Ca. This particular restaurant is called Cha Ca La Bon, and it's inspired a dish at a restaurant here in Portland, in southeast Portland, at Pok Pok. So go to Pok Pok and try Chuck Ha. That's pretty good. Also, if you go to Vietnam, there are a handful of taxi companies, I'm not sure you have your mind. Um, a lot of them charge you for distance as well as time, and then they happen to get lost. So my plan was very <laughs> honest. Uh, and this was my favorite taxi company. It was very cheap. So Vietnam has a varied landscape, anything from the northern mountains to the southern regions of the Mekong Delta. This particular site is Ha Long Bay, which is a, um, a world heritage site. And it's very beautiful. Uh, there aren't really many cities, I guess, per se, in this area because it is such a, a beautiful and renowned spot. But there's a lot of tourism, and these are all the kind of junks, uh, they call them junks, the little boats, that they use to tour and give people tours. This is up in the northern regions near Sapa. And the northern regions are unique in that they are very mountainous. They're still also mostly covered with forest, though they're struggling in keeping their forests these days um, because of the rice and kerosene, which is very beautiful, but it does present an ecological problem in that they have to deforest as well as uh, cause a little bit of erosion to harvest their rice. It's also really difficult to get up into the mountains. They only have a few access roads still. And that has been beneficial in keeping the culture intact. So it's a, it's a good tourist site. A lot of people like to go and see the, the traditional Hmong and the traditional dress, or the traditional ways of living that they still practice. But it also causes problems um, in terms of updating things, such as this hospital. But you do have a beautiful rustic quality about it. And it's really great to visit. So these are the rice terraces. Mm -hmm. They're beautiful. Um, they 
harvest about one crop a year, whereas in the southern regions they, they can harvest two crops because the weather isn't quite as severe as up here. These are three Hmong girls that followed my tour group and later tried to sell their goods to us. They're very pushy sometimes. I didn't really want to buy it. This is what a traditional or a typical mid-sized city in central Vietnam looks like. This particular city is called Nha Chang. It's, a, it's more of a touristy city. It's mostly made up of beach resorts, so there are a lot of private beaches. Um, those beaches are beautiful. The city itself isn't quite super spectacular, but in the center of the city, it does have ancient ruins from the Chang dynasty. Um, the Chang are what they need their ancestors. And these are what those towers kind of look like. And I think that this is one of, well, it's something that you find everywhere in the world, finding these ruins that we're not used to in America because everything is so new here. But I found it striking to find these ruins incorporated, ruins like this incorporated into their architecture. So maybe you'll stumble on an ancient doorway or an ancient toilet. Mm -hmm. So. Um, here is in the, this is a temple in the village of Dok Nam, and that's one of the places where I conducted one of my studies. But this temple I wanted to show is kind of an example of how Chinese, the Chinese influenced Vietnam during their occupation. Um, China occupied Vietnam for a thousand years, and then uh, for a hundred years the French occupied Vietnam. So after the French occupied Vietnam, they regained their independence, but only direct, only for like a year, and then the U.S. came in and fought fought them for 20 years. They were pretty excited <laughs> to have their own their own freedom, and so they still have many temples like this. It's the focal point in small villages. Um, they're also very active at least once a month. So you know, temples are very beautiful and I, I think that I'm not really very sure of what Chinese architecture is but I think that this is probably their own interpretation of how they feel like it should look this religious architecture the roofs themselves many many Vietnamese structures still use tile roofs they have two layers of tiles the top tile is what you see that's kept um, stacked one on top of another and then underneath is the flatter tile that, that they lay on first, and that helps to give it a second layer of protection against rain and the elements, but it also gives them an opportunity to have kind of this aesthetic quality. Um, I was told that this symbol on here represents life and longevity. I'm not sure, but... Um, and then I guess in, in modern roofs, sometimes they'll put a moisture, a moisture barrier or water barrier between the two layers of brick to give it that extra protection. So here are some more. You can see strongly in their architecture they have a dragon motif. Um, Vietnamese have a lot of tradition um, with dragons. The country itself is shaped like an S and the sinuous curve of that reminds me of dragons. Uh, Hanoi used to be called like the city of the dragon at one point, so we'll go into that later. They have a lot of beautiful inlays and things that happen within our architecture. As you go to the countries, the, the countryside that's just outside of the city, you'll find these kind of structures which are pretty standard even maybe even here. But as you get farther into the country, you find the more the more traditional vernacular way of building. These particular structures are recreations of these. They're at the Museum of Ethnology in Hanoi. And the city of Hanoi saw this problem of bringing the world economy in there, modernizing their country, and they saw the problem of their traditions being lost. And so their response was to create this Museum of Ethnology as a way to preserve the cultures that are still existing today and to help people not feel like they're aliens when they come to the city and that they can still practice their traditions and that it's okay. So. Uh, it's funny because everywhere you go, they'll be in Hanoi, they'll make sure, like, have you been to the Museum of Ethnology yet? Because it's really important. <laughs> um, and it is a very, very cool place. Uh, you can see here on the left the structure, and even here on the right, the structures are typically lifted up off the ground at an entire level. 
and that allows the, the ventilation to go underneath and through the buildings, but it also allows people to come and congregate and work and get, casually gather under the shade of their structures. And then it allows them to live in the cooler atmosphere upstairs. They have a slatted bamboo, and it's kind of scary to walk on. But um, it's also very cool because they have these ways of drawing the heat up with the roofs and then out. So it's a, an ingenious way of dealing with their hot, humid climate. This is a Hmong structure. And then another interesting vernacular is that of the boat culture, which is in the farther south. This is in the Mekong Delta. And the rivers are still the most efficient way for a lot of a lot of communities to trade and bring their goods to the cities. And so the river culture is very strong still. Here, there's definitely the need to have gasoline on the river. Or by building their houses on the river, they can have easier access to buying the goods and having the first go at, at getting the great deals. What I like about this picture is all of the telephone antenna, or the television antenna. <laughs> I think it's really interesting. Uh, so now we'll go into Hanoi. And just a little bit of the history of Hanoi. So um, this is an aerial of Hanoi today. This is looking northeast. This is looking southeast. And then this is looking to the west. And what you're looking at, well, up here is the Red River, and then the shore on the other side of the Red River. And then right here is the West Lake, where much of the development is now happening. I guess you can tell that. <laughs> Most of the wealthy people live along the side of the West Lake because it doesn't flood quite as often, whereas the poorer people live by the river because the land is cheaper and it floods all the time. So there's that interesting dynamic. This is Hanoi in uh, the early 15th century. So Hanoi was established as a humble borough in the 5th century, but it wasn't officially proclaimed a city until in 2010, when it was named the capital of Vietnam, and at that time it was known as Tong Long, which is known for the interpretation as the ascending dragon. Um, from the first time that it was built, they built this uh, citadel, which remains today, but in a different form because of the transformations that the city has experienced. So Hanoi, because of its location on the Red River, they ended up being kind of a, a good spot for economy to thrive. A lot of people brought their trade in and then ended up gathering there. Um, during the 17th and 18th centuries, foreign trade even thrived there. And then during the uh, early 19th century, uh, it was, well, the citadel was ordered to be rebuilt by the emperor and he had the help of French traders uh, he also, at this time, or around 1831, they changed the name to Hanoi, which means the city in the, in the bend of a river. So it's because the, the Red River is up here and it bends down like that. By 1873, the French came and took over, and they replaced the citadel with an even more French style. So they'd already influenced the citadel to be kind of French layout, but now the buildings are French. Um, and that still stands today, though it lay unoccupied for several years. In the early 1900s, they started to bring in city planners, which then helped the city develop more. And so you can see um, Citadel was in this area here. Then this is the old quarter where all, it was called the commoner city, where all the people started trading and they developed their own kind of vernacular. This is the French quarter with the squares, the grid streets. You can tell. This is 1936. This is essentially what this area looks like today. One of the interesting things to note is that as Hanoi, so we'll go from the back, as Hanoi keeps growing, they keep filling in all these lakes around here. And this is causing a little bit of a problem for Hanoi. Um, Hanoi sits on top of an aqueduct or aquifer, and there's water underneath the city that they draw all of their water from. And they've now polluted the water so they can't drink the water from there. But um, 
because they keep drawing it for the industry that's in the area, the city itself is actually sinking. So it's sunk a couple inches in just the last decade, which is causing another problem because the only barrier that they have against the flooding from the river is this street that they built up and that's the only barrier that they have. So this is the old quarter today. I live right there. Um, this is Juan Quin Lake, Return Sword Lake. And all of the, many of the streets maintain the names from what was the traditional trade of those streets. So for example, Hong Choi is Banana Street. Hong Bong is Cotton Street, or Hong Lai is Cot Street. This is one of the future plans of Hanoi. Hanoi is expecting to grow about 7 million people in the next 20 years. And they don't really know what to do with all those people. And so they're going to increase their boundaries about three times. And they've had a series of different studies on how they want to grow. So in this plan, the current city is about this big. And then this is what they want to expand to. And one of their goals is to create a second city center, which is more technologically based. This city center, they don't want it to have built right on top of the old quarter because they want to maintain the ancient feel of the quarter and to maintain the tourists that come. So um, they want to locate it somewhere else, but they've been debating whether or not they should locate it on this side of the river or this side. In this plan, they locate it up here. There's a problem with that in that they only have two bridges there. So that plan was thrown out. And this is the current plan that's being debated. They're working with a firm from Korea and a firm from the US to develop this plan. And their new goal, their new major goal, is to make it the greenest city or capital city in the entire world. Uh, here, the, their idea is to have 60% of the space be open space, and then the rest have small pockets of development that feed into the larger city, Hanoi. And they'll keep this part as kind of the main city center and well, the city center is right about here. This is West Lake, and then right above here is where they want to develop their new technology city center. So keeping it closer, but they're still debating whether or not maybe they should push it to the other side of the river up here. Um, also, they'll be relocating quite a few farmers in this area. Um, while they're still maintaining farms there, they want to have it be more like a bigger business farm industry. They don't want to have quite as many smaller farms, and so they're pushing them. They'll eventually push a lot of people up to the lower income housing places, which they're going to situate up here. So this is the, the old city currently, and they've done a lot of studies. They really want to focus on repairing the old city because they know that this is this is important for tourism. This is what people want to see when they come to Hanoi. And so they want to use that as their way of also addressing a sustainable economy. Um, tourism is their biggest industry. So here, though, the problem with that, I guess, is that they're focusing their redevelopment on the edges of the street where people are living, or where people walk and see. But then the interior of these places are just a jumble. They're just kind of a mess of crazy stuff happening. So a couple of firms that I talked to addressed some of these issues. They want to um, help people have better access to, to the plumbing and the electricity that they need. This is a model of that. This is, this is what it looks like when you're looking down into the interior. And then many of, this is a little cafe that I went to, and I just thought they had many different ways of responding to it. To get to this cafe, I had to go through the alley and into the interior, but this is how they kind of made it interesting and pretty. So I just like the way that they respond. This is a typical street. They have a lot of power lines. Uh, this is the old, the ancient house is what they call it. It was the first thing that they repaired and it's used as a, an example of how they want to restore buildings in Hanoi. Um, I'll talk about that a little bit later. They call it also a tube house. This particular structure is an example of the fusion between the French and the Chinese architecture. This architect really wanted to have the two fused together and influenced a couple of the building styles in Hanoi. But a lot of Hanoi maintains this, this very French feel, at least a lot of the French quarter. 
And even nowadays, when people build contemporary homes, they want to imitate a lot of those things that they see. And then, of course, I'm going to talk about Vietnam without talking about Uncle Ho. And uh, this particular building is actually in Saigon, but he represents a lot of, well, he represents modernization to the Vietnamese. And a lot of the structures that are political, governmental, or related to him are very modern. This is his mausoleum. So, uh, my study, I did a comparative study on, contem on the contemporary building materials and the traditional building material of laterite. And to do this study, um, I wanted to study the efficiency of heat, how heat is absorbed into the material. So I used two of these two specific pieces of equipment. This is a Raytech sensory gun. I'm not sure how many people know this, so I'll just go over it quickly. Basically just reads the temperature of a wall, and the closer you get to it without actually touching it, the more accurate it is. So I measured the inside wall temperature and the outside wall temperature of the same wall, and that gives an idea of how it's absorbed throughout the wall. And then this is a Hobo data logger. And this takes time series measurements of temperature. So you leave it into the, in the house for like a week is what I did. And it takes measurements periodically throughout the day. Uh, this is the street just outside of the house that I study. Here are some of the rooms. This is on the top floor, or one of the top floors. This is the, the only room that was air conditioned at the time, but they didn't want to keep the air conditioning on, and so they were nice enough to let me study without air conditioning, I suppose. Um, the stairs are very narrow and they're very tall, which makes them more efficient for the long structures. And it seems that each balcony tends to have this opportunity, or they take the opportunity to grow the plants and herbs that they want. Um, these are just sketchy diagrams of it, but basically you walk in and there are the stairs that wrap around and around. Um, and I placed two data loggers on the ground floor and one on the top floor. And these are the, the time series measurements. The red is the outside, the yellow is the upper floor, the blue is the inside. As you can see, the blue does, the, well, the construction of this particular house is that they have a concrete frame that they make and then they infill the walls with brick and then they plaster over those brick walls. So this type of construction does provide a heat barrier, but it's um, not quite as efficient as the ladder as we'll see. The average temperature is maybe 90 inside. This is the village of Dung Lung. Here's the entry. This is the Pretty typical entry for small villages. They want to have kind of a procession going in. You come up to where the temple is, which is right on the town square. There's the temple. You can go down the street. To get to the houses, they all have entries on these alleyways. Uh, a lot of the houses are built of this ancient brick, is what they call it, though it's only the brick is only like 100, 150 years old, so it's not the most ancient material that they use, but this is how they used to build some of it. And this is laterite. Um, laterite is a surface clay that's usually found in hot, wet tropical areas. The material is rich in iron and aluminum and develops through the weathering of underlying parent rocks. Um, iron oxides such as goethite and hematite cause the red brown color of laterite. And there are firmer variations of laterite, and those can be cut into blocks. So all they need to do is just go to where the laterite is, cut the block size that they want, lift it up, dry it for three days, and it's ready to build. So they have many different ways of building with it. This is an interesting wall. Some of the doors I thought were beautiful. Um, this is a traditional door handle where you just twist it. Nowadays, for the ladder of construction, they do put mortar, though it's not necessary. This is a close-up. So this is the house that I study. 
All of the walls, except for this wall, which is in the, the entry room, were made out of Monterey, so it made it kind of ideal to study. Um, this lady also was, she works with the restoration group that helps restore these houses. This particular house was built in 1830, um, and then these clay pots, they hold her second side of business, which is uh, making like a soybean paste, mm -hmm. similar to miso, but it's what they use in cooking. This is where I place the data loggers. So here's the courtyard you saw you were looking at this wall. This is the interior. This is a bedroom where they slept, and then this is the outside. And this is the, the current data. So the average is much lower um, by about two degrees, I determined. So it is a little bit more efficient. Um, I think that the biggest thing that I found through these studies was that laterite mediated the temperatures a lot better than the concrete brick did. So concrete brick had higher variables throughout the day. So, <laughs> so what does this have to do with architecture and why does it matter? And I've been finding myself asked that question because Vietnam is now facing um, a lot of interesting issues. They're building over a lot of these areas where the laterite can be harvested. So really they're faced with using, only, like their only option is to use this brick and concrete. Also because they deforested a lot of their forests as they were making their country industrialized. So they have a lot of problems with forest harvesting and this is really what you would build. Um, this is the old house that I was talking about earlier. And I, I kind of feel like maybe it's not just the materials that, that one should look at, but also how the design strategies are made. So here, this, this is a design that was developed because when the, the merchants were first building their houses in the old quarter, they were taxed on a street frontage right here. So they would make their street frontage very small, the smallest that they could, which is about 14 feet. Um, sometimes even smaller, but that's the average. But then they make them long, as long as maybe 60 meters or like 100 feet. I don't know. <laughs> um, so they would get they would get really long. And nowadays this house is actually it stops about here, and then comes the interior courtyard. Um, but it provides a lot of opportunities for heat to come through and up, and then through and up through these different courtyards. So here is one of the courtyards. It also provides light wells, which gives the natural light. This is looking across the open courtyard on the upper floor, looking up from the courtyard, looking down into the courtyard. And this is the condition that they have, that they're dealing with now, these old structures flooding right up next to new structures. And you have these beautiful opportunities to have windows and kind of beautiful expressions of how to take care of rain going into the windows. Mm -hmm. Well, it's not just Vietnam that builds this way with the brick and the concrete. Um, this particular picture is from Egypt. Mm -hmm. I haven't gone there, but I pulled it. Um, this one's from Belize. They also build the same, well, similar way, different mm -hmm. kinds of bricks. And then recently we've seen that this is, I mean, it's how they build in Haiti. Um, they have all of these structures that were built by the they don't have any forests. But as you can see, it's structurally unsound, and it probably wasn't very comfortable. So I guess my conclusion is that we know that many, that technology is not available to everyone simply because of the cost. Um, but we also know that new technology can be wasteful, because once it's used, we have to throw it away. So it seems that passive strategy, strategies will be the answer. But if we're facing these material problems, what would be the passive strategy, and how can we make them structural? Uh, I found that in the end, my study provided more questions for me than answered, but it was a good start. And I, I hope that people continue to study things similar to this. Um, and I believe that there's more information out there that we can find solutions. So I'd like to open it up now for discussion and questions. <laughs> In the corner, thanks. So uh, do these bricks, these traditional bricks, I guess, can they be kind of 
thrown back into the earth to disintegrate, or what's their life cycle? Like? Um, laterite, yeah, it's it needs to be protected from the rain because eventually it will it will degrade. Okay. So they usually have eaves that are over it. But yeah, I mean it's just earth. That's yeah, it is. Is it does it get pretty hard? Just for the pictures, it feels like it's spongy, but I guess it's yeah, no, it's really hard. It feels as hard as like a concrete. Huh. So I mean I don't know. Structurally, you're not supposed to build over two layers or two stories, but I mean it feels very hard. So yes. You said something that it didn't necessarily need the mortar room. Yeah. Is, is there something that hold it together or just the weight of it? Um, yeah, just the weight. I mean, there there are construction techniques. It's ashlar, right? Or, I mean, where you just you can just lay the brick on top of each other, and it will be structurally sound. And because they can't go over two stories, it's not really needed to keep the mortar. Um, it's still structural without the mortar. Yeah. Does Vietnam have any kind of seismic activity to worry about? I'm not sure if they directly have that much seismic. I mean, we know that there is seismic activity based on tsunamis, but I don't think that they suffered quite as much. I haven't really looked into it. I don't think they've fallen into the front lines. I mean, like, there's a front line from Japan, and then, like, maybe, like, on the east side, it's not but I don't think. I guess based on what I'm asking, it's like, is there any need for reinforcement or anything within the race? Um, well, I haven't seen any, so I don't know. Probably not. the temperature was more stable is because it had an insulating effect with voids in the laterite? Or what's your speculation? Because clearly the brick and concrete has a lot of thermal mass. So I would think that that would actually be a good thing. But you're saying that this performed better. And I was just wondering, what do you think explains the difference in performance? Um, I think that, that the voids could have something to do with it. it doesn't, it's not quite as thick a material, so having those buffers. But some of my data loggers were close enough to the wall on the inside that I'm guessing that just the material was able to retain more of the heat than the brick. Because the brick seems to, um, it traps it, but then it lifts it off a little bit sooner than the laterite. Right? The laterite, right, I'm guessing, it just dissipates it. So that was my observation. go back next time, what would you do to understand these buildings better? Um, I guess I would look at the difference, like rather than focusing on materials, perhaps I guess I'd look at more of the design strategies that they're using and study that, um, just simply because I feel like maybe their future is with materials that they're using now. Even if this is the better choice, I don't know. I don't see, they don't have like an abundance of it. So I guess that's what I study. Yeah. So the corridor typology has a really rich tradition throughout Asia. And you can see how it's working in traditional buildings as well as in contemporary things. Throughout Singapore, Malaysia, you know, all that whole region, yeah. I think there's been really interesting adaptations in a contemporary way. Yeah. Is this a product that anyone can make? Like you see people just get the mud and make it? Or is it yeah. like produced somewhere? And well, as, as it is, I mean, as far as I saw, yeah, anyone could just dig this up out of the earth. But it needs to be the right spot. It needs yeah. to have the right mud. Um, but the same goes for the brick, honestly, the brick that they use. I would wake up in the mornings and there'd be the old people doing yoga and then there'd be really old people carting bricks across the city and bringing it to the construction workers that were building new houses. So I think that right now as it is, they don't really have like a, there isn't a material standard, I suppose. Yeah. But yeah, anyone can make these just needs to be right. Did you notice any attempt, it seems like material is kind of like our brand or basically like I mean, we can block special dirt and becomes what it's susceptible to the element. And there's some, you know, 
people like here doing things like modern thing, modern thing, with grand earth. And it seems like you could build a building like out of concrete frame or something, and then you could use this and form it into this solid mass that does like. Is there any modern architecture that you've seen that use that? Uh, I didn't see it. It's mostly villages that I saw mm -hmm. were do, using the laterite. I also think that it's probably difficult to extract from the earth in large walls. I think it's usually going to be built out of bricks, just simply because you have to extract it as it is. Right. I don't think that they like dig it up and then compact it. Like you just right, but they could remove. I mean, it was a big enough operation. They could take yeah. a slab out, right, and cut it like we do, like granite pieces, huge right. pieces. Yeah, but I suppose they could. Yeah. Um, I didn't see anything that was like that, I'm going to say. It would be interesting. But some of the temples and stuff are made out of laterite, right? Yeah. The ancient ones, and they've survived for like centuries. Right. Well, apparently. They protected. Yeah, I mean, laterite's not, it's not even a unique material specifically to Vietnam. It's kind of in Southeast Asia. Mm -hmm. So they use it in India, they use it in Angkor Wat in Cambodia, mm -hmm. uh, which is ancient, really ancient. Mm -hmm. So this stuff can survive. But it can also do compose probably if not taken care of. This is one broader question, I guess. But you're saying some of these master plans were done by firms outside of Vietnam, which I find interesting. And it's like your city and you're outsourcing to like other places. But so, what did you kind of feel the architecture in relation to the government and politics was? That's kind of a side note. Did you pick up on any of that? Oh, I did. Um, I actually met with a couple of firms and then the secretary, the, the planner, the city planner. Uh -huh. um, they do outsource a lot of to a lot of different foreign firms, mm -hmm. but the process to actually get it built is so difficult that if a foreign firm is like determined enough to go through that, then it will get built, but it won't look anything like. I mean, it'll look maybe they'll retain maybe 30 or 40 percent of the, the original design of their own. So um, I have actually like three large documents upstairs. I should have brought them. But uh, the first document is this beautiful plan done by this firm. And I mean, they wanted to, they're trying to design well, one of those smaller cities within the larger city of Hanoi. And so it's this beautiful plan from Hong Kong. And it has these fingers of like green mm -hmm. architecture, or like the, the farmland is just stretching. They call them fingers, is what it, it was explained to me as. So then they bring it to the Vietnamese firm. Um, who then translates that to the Vietnamese codes, and then that goes to the government, who then says, well, we'll keep one finger, one green finger. So I know it's really frustrating for architects in there. Almost every firm I talk to, they're like ready to strangle the government, but everyone else seems to be pretty happy. So I don't know. Yeah, I